Welcome to the Industrial Real Estate Show. My name is Chad, and I'm very excited to bring you a bonus episode this week featuring the legendary Bob Knackle. For those of you who aren't familiar with Bob, he's the head of the New York Private Capital Group at JLL in New York, and he has done over $20 billion worth of brokerage transactions, and he has a ton of value and insights to share in this interview, anywhere from a new broker all the way up to a seasoned and experienced broker. I can assure you, you're going to get some value from this. So let's jump into it. Hi, Bob. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me on this interview. Happy to be with you, Chad. Always great to uh, to talk about real estate with a real estate pro. Absolutely. Well, well that's, I feel like I'm in the honor of a of a real estate great because I I've followed along with your journey of you're you're the closest thing we have in the industry to a real celebrity. So I feel like somehow I've I've known knowing you informally from a distance from a long time. And it wasn't until you joined Twitter recently that I started following along even more. And I just had to reach out to to ask you to come on the show. So I'm very grateful for you taking the time to, to join me on this. And where I'd like to actually start is you put out a baseball card. It was a few years ago, I believe I, I saw that the first time. Is that correct? Uh, actually, less than a year ago. I, I oh, came it? out last fall. Uh, and the genesis of the card was, you know, I, I, I've been in the business 39 years, the 26 years I, I ran uh, my own business with Paul Massey, Massey Knackle Realty. Uh, and then we sold the business to Cushman and Wakefield. And then in 2018, I moved from Cushman and Wakefield to JLL. And uh, I had a client that I've done several deals with over the years. And I see him all the time at the uh, I'm on the executive committee of the Real Estate Board of New York. So I see him at the monthly luncheons, but we haven't done a deal together in several years. And I bumped into him walking down Park Avenue and we started chatting and we're catching up. And uh, he mentioned to me that, uh, you know, he was thinking about uh, breaking ground on a uh, development site he had in Long Island City to build 300 apartments. And he was going to be in the market for a construction loan. Uh, I said, hey, you know, you really should talk to our mortgage brokers. We have a great mortgage brokerage group. And he said, oh, Bob, thanks very much. But I decided I'm going to use JLL for the debt. And I said, I've been at JLL for four years. He said, oh, my gosh, I keep thinking you're still at Cushman and Wakefield. So I said to myself, what could I do to um, let people know where I am and the, what the trajectory has been and that kind of thing. And uh, as a kid, I grew up collecting baseball cards, loved looking at all the stats on the back. And I thought, you know, what better way uh, to let people know uh, where I am? I put a big JLL on the front and then on the back, the, the history of all the years. And I did it kind of as a goof for, uh, for that particular client. And ended up uh, getting around, and and it's kind of gone viral since then. So it's it started as just kind of a fun thing, uh, and uh, I hand it out as my business card now. It's gone so viral that it's been around less than I actually thought it had been. <laughs> that's that's how many times I must have seen it. I thought it's been longer. I'll put a picture of it up uh, when when I'm producing this uh, so that people can actually follow along with it because it's impressive the stats that you have on there there's over 20 billion dollars worth of real estate that you've sold several years you were over a billion dollars I think everybody knows you as, as a very successful broker if it's okay with you I would actually like to go to some of the years where the times might not have been as good as as the highlight years where you're hitting grand slam after grand slam. And I'm sure that there's a few that resonate with you, like 2020, 2008, 2009, 1990, 91, perhaps. And then even some of those early years where uh, the numbers were much less than the billion dollar plus years that you've had. If you're comfortable with it, I'd like to dive into some of those uh, those things and really get a sense for what the market was like and then how you navigated through those choppy choppy times. Yeah, happy to happy to do that. It's not uh, not always uh, you know roses in this business. There there are tough times. And what what I tell young people today is that the market has been, is, and always will be cyclical. And you go through tough times and good times, and you know hopefully you you make it through the tough times and put yourself in a better position to take advantage of the uh, the good times. Um, so it's, uh, it's just a matter of stick to itiveness, but uh, happy to talk about those challenging times. Cause I would imagine there are a lot of folks out there that are going through those challenging times right now. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I started in 2005 myself, and I went through the Great Recession 2008, 2009, which was tough, but I was still relatively young into my career. And since the market started recovering, call it 2010, 2011, we went largely a decade with no downturn to speak of other than some blips along the way. Uh, the March 2020 to June 2020, that was obviously a disruption, but things recovered quite quickly from that as well. Uh, so with the exception of three or four months either way, the better part of 12, 13 years have been on an upward trajectory. But it, I think we're getting into a period now where there's more stress and more pressure and a lot of the younger brokers and not even fresh out of, out of their real estate license brokers, but people that have been doing it for 10 years haven't really faced uh, a recession. So I guess the one thing that I'd ask is what does today feel like compared to 2000, maybe late 2007 coming into 2008? What does it feel like to you? Well, I think it's a, it's very different from the great financial crisis. Um, that was a um, an event that kind of happened very abruptly, uh, very sharply, very deeply. Um, this one has played out a little differently. And that's the interesting thing about history is that history repeats itself, but it's always a little different. Um, and I think the one thing that I find unique about this market and, and particularly uh, within New York, and I, I, I unfortunately, my, my perspective is very New York centric because that's where I do all my work, but hopefully it, it translates into other markets. Uh, I think if you look at the savings and loan crisis in the early 90s. Uh, you look at the recession in the early 2000s, dot-com bubble bursting, Russian, Russian credit crisis, 9-11. Uh, uh, and then you look at the great financial crisis. It, it seemed like for those three corrections, the whole market was kind of moving in unison. Yes, there were different percentages that things went down by, but everything was kind of moving together. This time, uh, what we're seeing is that different product types are performing very differently. Um, prior to the COVID shutdown in 2019, we had a very draconian change in our rent regulation laws that changed how the multifamily market has, has performed. Uh, so even before COVID, it was a big gut punch to the industry with, with the way those policies change. Um, but multifamily is kind of doing okay. Um, reason being that all of the uh, legislation that has either been implemented or ignored over the last five years has done nothing but exerted upward pressure on rents. So rents in the multifamily sector are actually going up. And based on the budget proposals that we have now, we expect them to go up even further. So multifamily is not doing so bad. Cap rates are up because lending rates are up, but revenue is up. And you know that market is is fairly solid. Um, it's the land market in New York, uh, the condo land market is doing fairly well. Values, yes, are down about 20 to 25% since September when lending rates started to expand. And our, our um, rental land market or residential rental land um, has basically that market has dried up completely because the tax abatement program that made rental housing feasible uh, has has expired. Um, and if we look at our retail sector, retail is actually a bright spot in New York now because for five years in a row, we had downward pressure being exerted on re retail rents. And uh, retail rents, although they're down significantly from their peak, uh, are perceived to have bottomed out. Uh, retail leasing activity is picking up. Uh, and uh, we've, we're getting calls for the first time in years from investors who want to buy retail. And then the office market here, which is probably similar to, uh, to around North America, uh, is uh, very opaque, trying to figure out what's going to happen with aggregate office demand. There's a huge uh, divide between Class A new construction office, which seems to be doing great, and everything else. But in this this cycle, each product type is really performing very differently. And that's different from the, the corrections that we've had in the past. And then you could also add in the fact that the, the labor market's doing so healthy as well with hundreds of thousands of jobs being added every month 
in spite of the feds intentionally trying to slow down the economy, the job market's doing so well. So yeah, you're, you're, you're hundred percent right. And I'm noticing this in my market as well as there's that bifurcation between call it an office, which is a less desirable asset right now than industrial, which is a very hot market. So it really does keep people on their toes, uh, if nothing else. If we were to go into a recession and the jury's out on whether we are in a recession or whether we aren't going to go into a recession, but assuming that we are, what would, what is your game plan to navigate through this similar to the three previous ones that you mentioned that you went through? Yeah, well, again, <clears throat> you, you have to, I think it's important to always kind of stick to your core values and principles, but constantly adapt to a changing environment. Uh, I think that if you go back and look at how we dealt with um, these these periods in the past, um, back in in the early 90s during the SNL crisis, again, don't forget, we didn't have computers on our desks. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have uh, a lot of the, the modern technology we have today. So uh, we would make our calls. Uh, nobody wanted to do anything. And then we played solitaire with a real deck of cards at our desk. Uh, waiting for uh, waiting for the phone to ring. Um, it was uh, it was a really challenging time, and I think probably the worst that I've ever seen was during the SNL crisis. It was really really tough until the RTC started to get up in into gear, and then it actually led to a period that was uh, a period of big growth for our our young firm. Uh, in that in 1990, starting late 92, 93, 94, we were selling a lot of property uh, for banks, uh, lenders that the RTC had taken over and actually led to a, a boom time when a lot of brokers had gotten out of the business, which happens in every downturn. And so these things typically lead to big opportunities coming out of them. But that was the, the SNL crisis. The recession in the early 2000s was an interesting one. Uh, we had a reduction in the volume of sales for four years in a row, but value never went down in one year during that four-year correction. Uh, and then we got to the great financial crisis, uh, 08, 09. Um, that was a, a very, very challenging time. I remember people running around trying to get $250,000 bank accounts to make sure they were diversified because they didn't know if their bank was going to be around. Um, it was a, a very, very precarious time. Uh, and, you know, now we were here today uh, trying to figure out what to do, uh, looking for sellers that are highly motivated. But I think what what we tend to do in periods where the volume of sales um, is is down uh, is to try to uh, beef up uh, your ammunition uh, and things that are going to help you take advantage of that inevitable uh, boom that's going to occur after we come out of this downturn. So, for instance, during the um, the um, uh, during 2020. Uh, when the pandemic was uh, at its peak, uh, that nobody was in the city, nothing was going on. We took the time to create marketing materials that we uh, are using now that are, are helping us win business. Uh, we did have, even though the, the market in New York has been in correction mode since October of 2015, we did have a 12-month period where I thought we were pulling out of it. That was the second half of 2001, first half of 2022. Uh, and then the interest rate increases really uh, started to exert further downward pressure on values. And, you know, we're back into a declining market again. So I think that um, one thing that uh, younger folks particularly can take heart in is realizing the uh, inevitable cyclicality of the market, uh, knowing that it is going to come back and, and to put yourself in a position to take advantage of that uh, comeback when it does happen. Uh, and maybe that is brushing up on your skills, taking a class in real estate tax, taking a, a class in public speaking or creating marketing materials that you're going to use when you're trying to get business when this this recovery happens. Um, but it's uh, it's really a time where, you know, we always say in our business, you have you you're you spend every day working in your business, but you have to spend time working on your business. Also, uh, it's really these downturns are actually great times to give some thoughtful um, work on you on working on your business uh, rather than in your business. 
Yep, that's a brilliant tip, and and I I hope people pay attention to that. And if they do find they have more time right now, look to build your business for the next five to ten years, as opposed to what's happening in the next five minutes necessarily. I, I know that's such yeah, a Chad. Chad, real tip. estate is a marathon, not a sprint. People have to realize that, and you have to have that perspective. Because if you're you're just rushing, trying to make the next deal, uh, inevitably you're going to make some decisions that are not in your client's best interest. Everything we we ha have to do as intermediaries is to think about what's in our client's best interest. And if you think of it as a marathon and not a sprint, you're in a better position to do that. A couple of ways that I encourage folks to do that is think that your client's your mom or dad. If your mom or dad owned the property, what advice would you give them? Uh, and to to realize that, you know, some of the best relationships that I've made over the years started when I told people, you know what, you shouldn't sell your building now. Uh, clients came and said, hey, I'm thinking about selling. And we said, no, don't think about selling. It's not the right time. And they look at you like, hey, you don't make any money if I don't sell now. And it's not about me making money now. It's about me giving you the right advice. And then you you get into that exalted position of being considered a trusted advisor by your client who who knows that you're going to give them uh, the best advice for them, notwithstanding the impact it might have on, on yourself personally. And once you get in that position, that's a client for life. Love how you ex explain that. And, and it reminds me of something I heard a long time ago is that real estate is the antithesis of get rich quick. Uh, it's it's very, very difficult to actually get rich quick uh, in this industry. But over time, using exactly everything you described on, on your your skill set and your and your habits is being patient, being an advisor, giving the same advice you'd give to a client that you would to your to your mom or your dad. I think that's such wonderful advice uh, for people to uh, to adhere to. And that actually kind of leads to the next question I have. What what would you be given for advice right now? And let's let's say your mom owned an investment property and your dad wanted to buy an investment property. What <laughs> would you be saying to each of them right now? Well, I, I think um, with regard to selling, uh, clearly today is not the optimal time to sell. Um, and we are advising most, not all, but most of our clients not to sell today if they don't have to. Um, there are strategic reasons why someone uh, may want to sell. Uh, there may be portfolio reallocation reasons. There may be tax reasons. There, there could be reasons that uh, the beneficiaries of those, those dollars when the property is sold are up in age and they, they are choosing not to wait to the next cycle because they may not be able to enjoy the money at that point in time. So there are a number of factors that go into it. Um, so I think on the selling side, we're telling people, you know, hold on for now um, and uh, not the optimal time to sell. And then the clients who say, Bob, thanks for that advice, but I need to sell now and here's the reason. Uh, or I really want to sell now, and here's the reason. Uh, those are the folks that you want to work for, because if somebody is truly a discretionary seller in a down market, highly unlikely they're going to sell, because everyone's a little bit disappointed with the the prices they're getting today. Um, in terms of a buyer, I would say uh, I'm surprised. I First of all, I would pat them on the back and say to be a successful real estate investor, you have to have two things, uh, capital and guts. Uh, and to invest when there's fear in the streets. And I always say that, you know, the way any market operates, it's a constant struggle, a constant battle between fear and greed. Clearly, fear is winning today. Um, and there's a saying that um, when the fear is rampant, you should be greedy. Uh, and if you ask investors that have been active for decades in any market, they will tell you, uh, almost unanimously, the best deals they ever made were when they bought property when everybody else was afraid to. And that's the circumstance we have now. So uh, I think that uh, if you're looking to buy, um, a, buy a property, if you think it's a good property, you'd like to own it long term, don't over lever it. And I think the folks who are buying today are going to look back 10 years from now and say, oh, my gosh, wasn't that a steal? The, the same people who had the guts to buy in 1991, 92 and 93 uh, were making 2x and 3x by 1998. Uh, the people who had the guts to buy in 2010 
Uh, I think of some of those trades where people in 2010 uh, bought buildings for $300 a foot and people thought they were crazy and they sold the same building for $900 a foot a few years later. So I think it takes capital, it takes guts, um, but I, I would be a buyer today. Uh, unfortunately, the thing that's slowing a lot of that, that appetite down it, are legacy issues that folks have. If you've been in the market, and I don't think this is a, any anyone is to blame for this, um, other than the fact that if you were active in the market, you have some legacy issues you have to deal with. Uh, cash in refinancings are are the overwhelming majority of refinancings today. If you have debt maturing, you have issues to figure out. Um, and that's just a function of the way the market is. No one should be embarrassed by that. That's just, you know, the way uh, that, that's what happens when interest rates effectively double in a relatively short period of time. It causes disruption. So uh, I think that a lot of people are very busy dealing with legacy issues they have. Uh, and are not focused on buying, but those that are focused on buying, I think are going to make some of the uh, the best acquisitions of their career uh, over the next 12 to 24 months. Very well said. Love it. I I, I completely agree with, with what you said. You just would say it much more eloquently than I could possibly try to stumble across myself. Uh, where do you, Knowing that nobody's got a crystal ball, uh, but is still in the, that advisement space. You're saying to your clients, now is not the right time to sell. Uh, what 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 do you say to them in terms of getting an indication on when might be a better time to sell? Do you have any outlook on that? Or is that just a wait and see, evaluate as new information comes up kind of thing? Yeah, well, I think there, there are a couple of signs that you want to look for. Um, I think that uh, number one, uh, there are some people sitting on the sidelines saying, well, I'm going to wait for interest rates to go way down again. I, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, if you look at I didn't see where the 10 year opened this morning, but let's say that generally for the past month or so, we've been in about a, a three and a half percent 10 year treasury environment. Um, a lot of people forget that over the past 50 years, the average 10 year treasury has been 5.4 percent. Mm -hmm. So we're still at relatively low rates, it's just it's a lot higher than it was for the past 10 years. Uh, so it, it seems high, but it's actually not. Uh, I think borrowing is very expensive because of the uncertainty in the market. Lending spreads have, have increased significantly. So I think a couple of the signs that we're looking for are when um, there is a little bit more certainty in the market, and lenders feel a little more comfortable, those spreads will compress, making borrowing a little more, um, a little less expensive. Uh, and uh, I think once we start to see a sector firm up, like the retail sector, where uh, there is little perceived downside, uh, because you have uh, rents that seem to have stopped going down, you have leasing activity that's picking up, maybe there's some upward pressure on on. Uh, retail rents now. And, and those are positive metrics to look at. And when you start to see things like that happening, that's a foreshadowing that things uh, should be getting better soon. But I think, again, we're going to have to look at each product sector separately uh, to figure out how that particular sector is going to perform. So knowing that uh, your, your advice right now would be sellers to pause uh, unless there's circumstances that needed them to sell and buyers are reluctant or hesitant or perhaps just want to see how things are, that, that means the pool of deals that are going to get done should subside. There should be a, a that pressure on on deal volume to, to go down. So from the standpoint of prospecting, your name carries a lot of weight and it, I'm sure you've got a, haven't done 20 billion plus worth of deals. You have a lot of clientele to draw off of, but you're still needing to be finding deals. So from your standpoint where you already have a, a deep Rolodex and a deep number of connections, what are you doing to find clients that you can bridge deals in a market where there's not going to be as much volume for those reasons? And then a two part question, you're, you're going to be different than the majority of brokers out there, especially the younger brokers. So what would you say to those brokers on how they should be trying to find deals right now? So your 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 situation first, and then what newer brokers should be doing? 
You know, Chad, I'm doing the same things I've always done. And that number one, number one goal always has been, always will be making prospecting calls. Uh, I still make a, a fairly significant number of cold calls every week. Uh, and I'm then I'm calling calling prospects, which are folks I know, they're warm calls. Uh, but you have to be dialing the phone and talking to people. Uh, I think that younger folks should take heart in that during these challenging times, um, folks need help. They they need insight. They need direction. Uh, they're they're looking for information that's going to help them make informed decisions. And so I think it's a real opportunity to uh, create very strong relationships with people by giving them really great advice. So to the extent you are a, a market expert, you're a specialist in a certain field, you can impart some wisdom or some insight uh, to clients, they're going to remember it. Because if you think about it, you help somebody when they're they're down, uh, they're going to remember that a lot more than if you help somebody when they're riding high. Uh, so it's very, very impactful and appreciated uh, by the folks who need help if you're helping them now. So I would do everything you can to try to help people as much as you possibly can. Give them insight into what's happening. Give them information that they could could use to to better their situation. Um, it, it's a it's a time, you know, the real estate business is always a, a relationship business first. Uh, and it's a time to really show that you care more about the relationship than the transaction by by helping people when they need it the most. Well said. What would be your message right now? I mean, you, you, perhaps you can even just walk through a, like a, an example of cold calling somebody right now. What What is your message when you're reaching out to someone for the first time right now? Well, you, usually if I'm calling someone for the first time, I have a reason for calling them. Um, maybe I'm selling something that I think they might have interest in because they uh, they own a similar property. Um, so let's assume I'm, I'm doing that. And my ultimate goal of any cold call or warm call uh, is to find out if there's anything that that particular person wants to sell. Um, for all of my transactions, uh, in all but two of the 2,252 that I've done, uh, I exclusively represented the seller. So I'm always looking for people who want to sell that will hire me exclusively. Um, but you you can't start with asking that. You need to offer something of value. So uh, I will call up a client and say, hi, uh, Mrs. Jones, uh, you own uh, 123 Main Street. Uh, I'm selling a similar property down the down the road. Would you have any interest in in purchasing uh, that building or, or looking at the information on it? Uh, if they say yes, you get engaged in a conversation, talk about it, send her the information. Uh, if not, say, well, uh, are you looking for anything else? Are you are you actively looking to buy today? Oh, okay. Well, I, tell me. I see you own one, two, three Main, and I, I see you own these other six buildings. How are things going in your portfolio? What's what's next for you? Uh, what are you thinking about doing? Uh, is there any? We just did a market report talking about the dynamics within. Uh, your particular neighborhood. Would you like to see that report? I'm happy to share that with you. And always use the word share. Share is a very powerful word. It's very benign, very uh, warm. They, you know, I'd like to share this market information with you um, and try to engage in a conversation. And maybe uh, Mrs. Jones will divulge that, hey, you know, I have a, a problem with the tenancy in this one building. And you say, well, I, I'm happy to have my retail folks who do store rentals, reach out to you to help you rent that store. Or my office leasing folks reach out and help you uh, find tenants for your office space. Uh, or some way offer offer to help in one way or another. And then, uh, you know, I always get around to saying, hey, by the way, is there anything in the portfolio you might be interested in selling now? Um, and I think that because of this refinance risk uh, and the cash-in refinance uh, risk that is out there, a lot of owners are looking at their portfolio and dividing their portfolio up into three buckets. The A bucket, which are properties they want to hold on to at all costs. The B bucket, which they are not sure what to do with. And the C bucket, which, hey, if I have to sell something, I'll sell these. Uh, and a lot of folks are selling the C buildings to get the capital to effectuate the refinancings on the A building so they can hold on to them. Uh, and that's a, a circumstance that a lot of people are faced with today. Uh, in talking to owners, 
Uh, many are reluctant to put fresh capital into effectuate the refinancing. So they rather sell an existing property to get that capital to uh, to put it in to uh, to get the refi done. But, um, you know, there are a million different things you can talk to a property owner about. And particularly today, um, when there's such a lack of clarity around what's happening, um, you know, if people have the overwhelming majority of their wealth in real estate, which most real estate owners do, uh, they should be willing to talk to you and they hopefully are going to learn something from talking to you. It's brilliant. And it's not only is it brilliant, but it's also s simple. Like there, there's nothing overly complex about anything that you said, other than people have to get over that fear of picking up the phone to actually start that outreach. Yeah, Can Chad, you... I think that's one of the, the beautiful things about uh, real estate brokerage. This is not rocket science. There, there's no secret sauce. It's a lot of very fundamental, we refer to it as blocking and tackling. Uh, the secret sauce, if any, uh, is just having the discipline to do it day after day, week after week, month after month, um, and to uh, keep doing those things, making the call, pick up the phone, talk to people, uh, have market presence so that when people think uh, of doing something, they think of you before they think of somebody else, or if they're going to interview a bunch of brokers, you're included in that mix. So market presence in terms of attending conferences, taking clients out, doing an email blast, doing a podcast like this, um, do you know going to a, an industry event, um, sending a hard mail. I still am a big advocate and believer in hard mail. I, I think that folks are so inundated with email today that uh, every now and then they just want to get their box cleaned out and hitting the delete button may delete something that they should look at. But a hard mail is something that has a little bit of shelf life. So, you know, I believe hard mail is an effective way to to build relationships also, but it's a myriad of things. Uh, and uh, to do all of these things, hopefully put you top of mind for people. So when they decide I need to transact, they think of you before they think of others. One thing that really is hitting home to me is that 39 years you've been in this business and 20 plus billion dollars worth of transactions, and you're still committed to doing all of these. There's no excuse for somebody that's new to think that they can get away with this. To to help this really sink in for someone that is perhaps scared or doesn't want to or doesn't think that they need to, can you share a success story or perhaps you have of a few, or perhaps it's one client that you've worked with that you connected with by doing a cold outreach that uh, that turned into a, a successful uh, sale. Can you share a story like that that comes to the top of your mind? Sure, absolutely. I, I you know, I when I started in the business in '84, um, you know, I partnered up with Paul Massey day two on the job. Uh, we had little neighborhoods that we called territories that we canvassed in. Uh, Paul worked from 55th Street to 63rd Street, from 5th Avenue to Lexington. I worked 55th to 63rd Lexington over to 1st uh, and just called every owner around every block. And there was this guy who owned a lot of big buildings and happened to own one little building uh, on East 60th Street named Harry Macklow. Uh, Harry is uh, now a billionaire, owns a ton of real estate. At the time, he was big back in the 80s even. Uh, and I called him back in those days. The way we tracked everything was on uh, in paper catalogs where we had a, a photo of the building that was pasted onto the page, uh, information on their, their name, phone number, et cetera, and then a bunch of lines where you'd write in uh, the the uh, the the notes from your, your call with the uh, the prospect. And for two and a half years, I cold called Harry and he never took the call. Um, so, but I kept calling him month after month. And um, I called one, one day, two and a half years in, I called his office about 730 at night. His secretary, who was the gatekeeper, had left for the day and he picked up I said, hey, Mr. McLeod, Bob Knackle from CB Commercial. He said, I know who you are. You've been leaving messages <laughs> for me for a long time. What can I do for you? I started talking to him. And, you know, I continued to send him mail, continued to uh, leave messages for him. Uh, when I called him, although I had never spoken to him before, he knew who I was. Uh, Harry's turned into one of my best clients. I've done over $400 million in transactions with him. Uh, my first... My first nine-figure transaction 
Uh, I sold a multifamily portfolio for him uh, in 2003 for $179 million. Uh, he's been a great friend, a great client. Uh, and it was just that persistence of continuing to call um, that made it happen. So don't get discouraged if, if people uh, don't uh, call you back. Uh, you got to keep trying, got to keep keep after it, have the determination and um, and continue to do it because if you do, good things will happen for you. That is an amazing story. I, I hope you write a book one day, actually, because I, I, I suspect that you've got, you could write an encyclopedia of stories like this, uh, uh, of just amazing things that, that have happened throughout your career and not by accident. It was, you had a very deliberate plan of attack and you've executed on it and you've just kept that same optimism. Like, it really strikes me that you just love being a broker. Yeah, Chad, I, I got to tell you, you know, when we sold the company, uh, we sold Massey in 2014. It was a, a great, great uh, uh, day for us. Um, and uh, I missed the company, but it was a life changing event financially. Um, and at that time, I, I thought to myself, OK, well, I'm going to be on a, a, a long term contract with Cushman. Uh, but what might I want to do after that? Uh, you know, do I want to buy buildings? Do I want to slow down a little bit? Um, and it occurred to me that, you know, I don't know anything about buying buildings uh, because I've never been a principal. Uh, I know how to sell buildings. I truly love it. And for me, uh, being an investment sales broker is both a career and a hobby. Uh, if my wife and daughter went out of town on a girl's trip for the weekend, I'd be selling buildings that weekend. Uh, it's what I enjoy. Uh, and so I feel very blessed that, uh, you know, I, I got into this business uh, and that uh, I love it as much as I do. I think it's the greatest business in the world. Uh, we deal with, uh, in, in two consecutive meetings, I might be dealing with a billionaire in the first meeting and a little old lady that inherited the building a hundred years ago, uh, you know, in the next meeting. And I, I love that aspect of, uh, dealing with a, a wide array of of folks that are active in the real estate business. Well, your enthusiasm is is absolutely infectious. So I, I do really commend you for that. And it actually leads to a, a one question that I wanted to ask. And it's a hypothetical question, uh, mentioning that you you're not a principal. I want you to actually if you're good to just go along with this for a second, to actually imagine that you are a principal uh, in a property, knowing everything that you know about brokerage and being exposed to your own shop, uh, larger shops, what would you look for? And what are some of the traits that you would identify in a successful broker? So you're now on the other side of the table and perhaps you're interviewing 10 different brokers to sell or lease whatever your mind fancies, uh, what would, how would you differentiate and choose one of those 10 brokers? Yeah, you know, that's interesting. I, I think that um, if I were a principal, I would look for number one, market knowledge. Um, and I think that that is a very important aspect of our business. I think the most frequently asked question that any broker is going to get is how is the market? Uh, the overwhelming majority of brokers answer that question with adjectives. I've always answered it with statistics. Uh, I think statistics show that you really understand the market. What's the size of the market? I could tell you Manhattan, south of 96th Street, there's 27,649 buildings. Over the last 39 years, the average turnover of that stock of buildings has been 2.6%. The highest it's ever been was 4.7 in 2012. The lowest it's ever been 1.6%. Oh, I'm sorry, 1.2% in, in uh, 1990. Uh, it, you, you need to kind of understand the market. So I think understanding the market is, is uh, number one. Number two, I want somebody that I feel is really passionate about the business uh, and is going to uh, gonna work um, not necessarily around the clock, but a lot. We, you know, we always used to joke around at Massey Knackle telling young people who wanted to get into the business, to be successful at this business, you only have to work half a day. Uh, we don't care what 12 hours you work, but you're working 12 <laughs> hours a day and then you, you could be successful. But um, you know, do folks pick up the phone if you call them? Uh, will they pick up the phone at nine o'clock at night? Will they pick up the phone at one o'clock on Saturday afternoon? Um, you know, Those are things that I would look for because I, I know that 
those people were really into it. And if they're really into it, they're probably going to do a good job. So knowledge, passion, those two things, which I, again is not complex, uh, but you, you need, it takes time. It takes work, takes effort uh, and, and a commitment for it, but not rocket science. So, uh, yeah. Love that. I, absolutely. Great way of saying it. And I, I put a, I put it on Twitter. I asked a few people, uh, or I just said that I was, had the opportunity to interview and I asked what questions I should ask. And there was a couple interesting ones uh, uh, that I'd like to run by you. Sure. Uh, one was from uh, Ron Rohde. So he's a, a little bit of context. He's a lawyer and an industrial real estate investor himself. So he's probably asking this question a little bit through the lens more of being a lawyer, but also himself as an investor on how you'd approach it. And, and he asked, uh, what are your best vendor relationships, uh, big firm versus small firm, used an example, like a law firm or CPA or engineering, how, how, or what are some of the best vendor relationships? And do you have a preference on either one of those? I look. I, I think that when it comes to vendors, it's uh, people that you are comfortable with, uh, and to to have a level of comfort, I think it's those people that you uh, spend time with, that you meet out. I, I think networking is a an extraordinarily valuable tool. Uh, real estate is a people business, uh, relationship business, so. Uh, to be out networking and meeting people, that's the most effective thing. There's a number of ways to make relationships. You can call people on the phone. You can email them, text mail them, hard mail them. Uh, but nothing takes the place or is better than face-to-face -face, uh, contact. So being out, meeting them. And I, I think that uh, whether it's a brokerage company, a law firm, a title company, uh, I, I don't think the uh, size of the business really matters. I think there are pros and cons to small firms, medium firms, and large firms. Uh, I think it's the individual that you're dealing with. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that uh, I, I have on the, the law firm front, uh, I have some great relationships with folks that are at the biggest firms in town, medium-sized firms, and uh, single practitioners. Uh, and there are different circumstances where each of those would be the best choice. And so I think it's important to know a lot of people, um, see how how people differentiate themselves. Uh, I'm a big believer in specialization, uh, and specialization uh, is, gives someone the ability to differentiate themselves from everyone else, and that, that differentiation leads to a competitive advantage. So I, I think it's great to, to know as many people as you can uh, when it comes to vendors and see who you like, who you have chemistry with, um, you know, uh, the um, likability is an important thing. I think you have to have um, aptitude and be good at what you do, but, uh, you know, to be liked and have chemistry with people is important too. So I think so many factors go into it. I don't think you can really generalize about one factor or another, but it just, um, you know, what has your experience been like? Uh, there have been some people I've liked a lot, but uh, uh, as an attorney, for instance, they get into the 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 deal room and they just crater the deal uh, because they need to show uh, how smart they are. Uh, and there are other folks that uh, will get into a room and, you know, they're a deal maker. They protect their client's interests, but they get the deal done. So I think it's a, a combination of instinct, uh, chemistry, and, and then looking at at the performance and seeing what they do for clients and then, you know, judging who you think the the best vendor would be for any particular situation. Great answer. Uh, closely related to that, and it's a question that I get asked often, is differences between a large brokerage like JLL or perhaps a regional brokerage or a local brokerage. Any advice on how you would uh, answer a generic question about what's better? Yeah, again, it totally depends. I There are pros and cons to big platforms, pros and cons to medium-sized platforms, and pros and cons to small platforms. Uh, I think that you it, it depends on the transaction that you're contemplating doing. Um, I, I know that in the... I, I'm not very active in the institutional world. Most of my clients are high net worth individuals and families. And I deal in what we call the private capital space. Uh, and I know in the private capital space, 
I think that um, investors make decisions based upon who they think is the best for that particular type of property uh, and that particular type of transaction. And to the extent that you focus on uh, one particular type of deal and have uh, a reputation for doing that particular thing, and you can articulate your value proposition while you do that better than others, that gives you an advantage. But I think that, uh, you know, product specialization is very important. Um, and you want to try to um, to be as narrowly focused as possible, because the more narrowly you focus, the deeper into that you are. Um, the real estate business is not really as much about real estate as it is information. And if you really take a deep dive into something, you're really going to know it very, very well. You're going to take the time to call the buyer and seller of every property that sells in your market to really understand that comp. It may have printed looking like one price per square foot, but when you dig into it and find out that there were additional monies paid to buy a tenant out or there were additional monies paid because of an environmental issue or something else, you'll understand that transaction better than the next broker. And if you can articulate that to the client, I think they're going to want to go with the person that understands that particular piece of business better than anyone. Such a great point. And I, I bet a very few people out there, and I'm in this camp myself, would actually call owners of properties that have sold if if they weren't involved themselves. But I, I completely see the benefit of if you're in the position of selling the property and one broker has all the comps, whereas another broker called every one of those comps and has more insight into it, that alone is a huge differentiator. So uh, love that point. I'm going to actually start taking that into account myself and start calling. Yeah, because Chad, numbers. how many people, how many sellers do you meet with that say, Hey, I think my building's worth 20 million because Sally just got 20 million for her building down the street. And, you know, you don't, that owner may not know that, you know what, she, before she sold, she abated all the asbestos in the building, or she just put a new heating plant in and a new roof and new windows and new elevator cab. And she just did a complete renovation. That was a completely different property. Um, and so having that understanding. You know, that's one of the reasons why I don't think that technology is going to completely uh, displace brokers. Uh, I think technology can can um, can help or, or displace part of what a broker does uh, in terms of maybe finding buyers. But the the negotiation part, the human element that's involved, because buildings are not widgets. Every building's different. The, the 100,000 square foot office building on the north side of the street can be very, very different from the 100,000 foot building on the south side of the street. And if you really, if you understand the market, you'll know what those differences are. And that that human element is something that I, I think will uh, be needed um, in the, the brokerage business moving forward. I certainly hope uh, it's that way for at least another 20 or 25 years until I... Uh, I, uh, I'm not doing this anymore. I, I, yeah, I, I agreed. I, I, the, the same way. I, I think that there's so many benefits that a broker brings to the equation. And it's not even just brokers. I think it's professionals in every area. There's there's some element that probably can be replaced by even today's current technology, not to even think of future technology. Uh, but there's always that human element where if you want legal advice, are you going to trust an AI bot versus hearing it directly from a lawyer or accounting advice, or tax advice, or brokerage advice? So I, I agree with you. It's, it, I, I don't see that changing fundamentally anytime soon, but I guess time will tell. Uh, and on on that topic, actually, there's a question that came it came in from Myron. I shouldn't say on that topic. On the topic of looking 25 years old, I should say. Another question came in from Myron. And he uh, and I think you were tagged in all these. So you might have had a bit of advanced knowledge that these were coming. Uh, I actually, I didn't I didn't see that, unfortunately. So I'm I'm uh you're you're hitting me with fresh information, but please go right ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, there'll be like right a, a real genuine answer that you didn't have time to, to think about. Then uh, he asked, uh, "What's your perspective on rising ocean levels impacting New York's real estate market over the next twenty five years?" Wow, that's uh, that's a uh, an interesting one. Um, 
you know, I think uh, there is a uh, there's a premium placed on uh, waterfront property today. So um, will Madison Avenue be oceanfront in uh, 25 years? I certainly hope not. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know enough about that to really have a, uh, a cogent answer. Uh, I know that the city is working on um, several uh, things that could help um, uh, alleviate concerns about that issue, but um, I, I don't know enough about those environmental issues uh, to uh, really have an opinion. I know that there are, are new buildings that are are putting uh, their mechanical systems and mechanicals of the building on floors above grade now. Uh, mm -hmm. rather than in the basement because of what happened during Sandy. Uh, most mechanicals for, for buildings are in the basement, and I think the industry is getting away from that a bit, particularly in areas closer to the uh, the water. But um, I, I don't know enough about that topic to have a good answer. Yeah, and, and I certainly have no insight into that uh, myself. It was a question that came up, and, and I thought that there was some an interesting element to that, but I, I think uh, you and I are, are real estate guys. We probably try to stay in our lane as much as we can. And uh, that's kind of when danger creeps in is when we pretend to talk about things that we don't necessarily know a whole lot about. Focus on real estate. That's where we make our living. Still an interesting question. It probably will be a topic. Uh, maybe when I put this on Twitter, or put this on LinkedIn, on LinkedIn and YouTube, maybe someone can chime in and and uh, give their perspective on it because I'm sure that that will be a topic that we have to continue discussing at some point in the in the future. So th thanks for your answer on that. And the next question, a little little tongue in cheek on this from Boomer Peterson. He said, uh, uh, "Ask Bob if he eats Wheaties every day or if he just pisses excellence naturally." <laughs> Well, I, I did eat Wheaties as a kid. Um, gosh, I don't know. You know, I think um, I, if there's a, a, a secret sauce uh, or something that a lot of people don't know about me, uh, I uh, I like to sleep and uh, getting sleep. You know, for most of my career, uh, I, uh, I was a four or five hour a night sleeper. Uh, and during the pandemic, uh, you know, the city was shut down. I was most of the time up at my country house in, in Connecticut, which is the, the happy place uh, for me. Uh, but I started sleeping longer. There was less to do. Uh, there was no commute. Uh, not that I have a very short commute at living in the city anyway, but uh, I started sleeping more and uh, I started feeling great. I felt so much better sleeping seven or eight hours a night. And so I think... Uh, you know, don't, don't eat Wheaties anymore, but I get my get my rest. And uh, that's, that's certainly something that has given me a lot of energy when I get into the office if I if I've had a good night's sleep. It's, it's a good message for everybody, because I think there's a lot of people running on too little sleep uh, out there. So if, if I agree with you, sleep is quite important. Uh, I'm uh, very respectful of your time, and I greatly appreciate you taking uh, an hour to to spend it with me. Uh, real quick, if we've got a couple minutes left, what what was the... Uh, the attraction to Twitter, uh, because that that's new for you, and you've accumulated well over ten thousand followers in a short period of time for a very good reason. You're throwing out a lot of great knowledge and insight in there. But what was the impetus uh, to get into onto Twitter, Chad? I just I succumbed to peer pressure. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> I I, I uh, for for years, folks were telling me to uh, you know you got to get on social media. It's great, and you've got you've got stories to tell and insights people would be interested in. And I I just uh, was a, a non-believer. Uh, and finally, uh, in November, I said, you know what? Let me give it a try next year. Let me gear up. Let me figure out what I'm going to do. Uh, and uh, January first, I started. Uh, and I, you know, I've had a Twitter account, I think since 2017 and a LinkedIn account since 2011, but I never actively went on. I, I never even went on Twitter until like January 3rd or 4th, uh, of this year. And, uh, I was not active on LinkedIn and we're doing some Instagram stuff also, but, um, you know, I, uh, I've been totally amazed at the reach that it has, the relationships that I've made, the business opportunities that have come my way. Uh, it's really, really remarkable, the reach that this has. 
and I've just been thrilled with uh, the way things have gone so far. And, you know, I, I was going to give it a, a three month shot. I'm, I'm now uh, three and a half months in and uh, I, I think I'm going to continue on it because it uh, it's really been eye opening for me. And uh, it's been a great thing. And I've gotten to uh, to meet and, and know uh, so many great folks and want, want that to continue. Well, I sure hope you do stick with it because it, it's very insightful uh, seeing your posts and you always inject a little bit of uh, humor uh, in there as well. And, and I, I'm a big fan. So uh, I, I wanted to wrap up uh, with that as well as just to encourage people to reach out to you, uh, connect with you on on Twitter. Uh, I, I don't think I've seen your LinkedIn yet, but I'll, I'll I'll, I'll follow you on LinkedIn as well. And just want to really encourage people to uh, to, uh, to connect and reach out with you because you're sharing a lot of great information as we demonstrated just in this hour, uh, how much value you packed into uh, into this hour. So really do want to thank you. I want to encourage people to uh, to, to follow you. And uh, hopefully if, uh, if I'm ever in New York, I'd love to uh, to buy you a coffee and, and meet you in person. Uh, but uh, I don't know how soon that will be, but if the time ever comes, I'll, I'll try to give you advanced morning because i'd love to be able to meet you in person well chad if the time ever comes you definitely give me advance notice and you come to my town the coffee's on me pal <laughs> perfect well look forward to it uh thanks once again bob really do appreciate your time you got it chad take good care and best of luck to everybody out there it's gonna get better just keep your chin up it always always has gotten better and this time is no different <laughs>